I think the um, the Kronstadt revolt uh, was, in some ways, the the end of a of a, a process. Uh, um, the a whole series of uh, peasant uprisings uh, against grain requisitioning, and also a wave of workers' protests, uh, which culminated in the um, Kronstadt revolt. And on um, March the 1st, um, it all started developing. Um, we should look back over the, the, the previous uh, three years, you know, we could e even look back to 1919 and um, the strikes at the Puterlog pl uh, plant, which is a huge factory in uh, Petrograd, which is very close to Kronstadt, um, where similar demands to those put, put forward by the Kronstadt sailors uh, in the Petropavlos uh, resolution were, 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 were mooted. Uh, and that resulted in the uh, uh, heavy repression um, of oh. um, the workers. Um, 200 were shot um, in similar circumstances. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've just been reading uh, about this, uh, about the, the Communist Party uh, meeting around Putilov where uh, Zinoviev, one of the leading Bolsheviks, uh, stood up and said um, that, in fact, the, 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 the workers at the Putilov plant, and you've got to remember that Putilov was one of the places that, that sparked off the revolution, along with the Kronstadt sailors. They, they, they were different uh, workers from the ones that had been there in 1917. And th this was the, exactly the same um, logic was used about the Kronstadt sailors by Trotsky, that they weren't the same sailors. And I'll talk all about that later on. Um, and also, um, you know, the other accusations that it was uh, inspired by uh, the right social revolutionaries, that it was a Kulak, Kulak uprising. And, you know, it, it seemed that the, by, by then, by 1919, um, it, uh, the, um, the Bolshevik party was in, in a sort of bubble. It was in, a, in, an, in this, um, this bubble of self-denial that actually workers and peasants were, were turning against Bolshevik rule. Um, it, it's the same sort of atmosphere that, 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 you know, if you like, you can compare it to Corbynism, where, you know, they thought the whole country is behind us uh, and Corbyn's going to get elected. And that didn't happen either. Perhaps that's a, a bit of a stretch, but there you go. Um, so let's put it in context. Um, where, um, where is uh, Kronstadt? Um, Maestro, could you? Yes, here we are. Um, it's on, a, as you can see there, it's on Kronstadt, the naval base is on uh, Kotlin Island. Um, it's a city, um, so it's not just uh, uh, sailors there, they're, they're, they were soldiers as well, and also the inhabitants. Um, and, it, and it dominates, as you can see, it dominates the, the approaches to uh, Petrograd, the, the city of Petrograd, which is uh, now reverted to the name of St. Petersburg. Uh, it, it was the, it's the largest naval base. And, and of course, uh, it was a bastion of revolutionary politics um, since 1905. Kronstadt uh, 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 sailors took a uh, leading role in, in the 1905 revolution. And um, it was uh, one of the first places where a Soviet was, was uh, set up in, uh, well, there was one set up in, in Kronstadt in 1905, another one uh, set up in, in 1917. Um, and um, the Kronstadt sailors were instrumental in uh, storming the Winter Palace and in... Uh, 
defending uh, Petrograd against the, the white advance. Um, when uh, actually, when uh, Trotsky became uh, People's Commissar for uh, military affairs, he, he actually soon came up against the, the Kronstadters. They, they demonstrated outside the Commissariat and um, for better wages and conditions. And he actually came out and harangued them. I mean, and, he, and they, 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 they actually scarpered. Uh, he was used to um, um, talking down to people because, you know, his father was a big landowner. So um, he had that rather arrogant air. Uh, and, um, but um, he soon came uh, in, into even greater collision with, with the Kronstadters later, later on. Um, so we, we, we've had a, a, a wave of uh, workers' uh, strikes uh, in Petrograd, mass strikes there in, in the run up to uh, the, the revolt. Um, right through March, the, uh, uh, many workers came out with the same sort of demands that were later um, developed by the, by the Kronstadters. And uh, also in March, um, sailors met on the uh, the um, two battleships, the um, Sebastopol and the Petro Petropavlovsk, and they uh, put forward um, demands uh, for. Uh, things like immediate new elections to the Soviets by secret ballot, freedom of speech and the press for all left and anarchist parties and groups, freedom of assembly for trade unions and peasant organisations. There were 15 demands altogether. Um, and um, the, the Kronstadt sailors sent um, an envoy uh, into Petrograd to see what was going on with the strike, and that, and they came back and, and and reported back on 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 the unrest that was going on there. Um, one of the leading Bolsheviks uh, turned up uh, on March the first. Uh, a guy called Kalinin. It was a town named after him. It was a uh, Kaliningrad later on under under Stalin, um, and he was shouted down. Um, and um, a mass meeting took play, place and the uh, resolution that had been adopted by the, the two battleships, that it was, which is known as the Petropavlos resolution after one of the battleships, was adopted. Um, and the, um, the Kronstadt sailors uh, formed a um, military uh, uh, re a provisional revolutionary committee um, there was an immediate uh, reaction uh, from the Bolsheviks, and particularly from Trotsky, who, who warned that um, um, it, any unrest would be, would be crushed. Um, and he also started saying that um, it was a, uh, a white plot. It was, um, it was a... Uh, in the hands of the White Guards, uh, it was he he headed by uh, General Kozlowski. In actual fact, Kozlowski was a, a, one of the military specialists that had been uh, um, appointed by, by Trotsky himself. And he had, um, you know, it, uh, it, uh, Trotsky portrays the revolt as in that, uh, manipulated by this, uh, this uh, ex czarist officer. Uh, in actual fact, he had very little um, um, say in the, in what happened in in the, in the revolt. Um, the um, Kronstadt insurgents started bringing out a paper called the Kronstadt Is Isvestia. You can now you can now actually get every single copy of it on the Crime Think website, and it's well worth a read as to what the um the um 
sailors are actually saying, the sa soldiers and sailors and workers of Cronstadt were actually saying. Um, and it was edited by um, a sailor called Petra Perapelkin and um, but also by um, a journalist uh, who, who worked at Kronstadt called um, Lamanoff. Uh, now, Lamanoff had been um, a member of the Maximalist Social Socialist Revolutionaries. Um, they were a split from the Socialist Revolutionaries, um, one of the uh, left groupings. And um, they, they were in many ways, you know, quite close to, to the anarchists. Um, and they started putting forward um, um, the, uh, the ideas of the, um, of the Kronstadt sailors. Um, the Bolsheviks decided to uh, uh, send in um, the troops under the control of um, Marshal Tukhachevsky, who, who was himself an, an ex-Tsarist officer. Now, in doing this, um, the, the, they had to use uh, um, units called blocking units. Th these have been developed um, by Trotsky. So they were units of 10, uh, adding up to 10 tens or, or a century, if you like. Uh, and they they stood in uh, behind the the uh, the lines and and stopped uh, with machine guns and stopped uh, people retreating. Um, in fact, there were mutinies in 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 two regiments um, who refused to go in against the the Kronstadters, and as a result, um, the, the instigators of the the mutiny mutinies in these two regiments were were shot. Um, the, um, the, these are the same blocking units that um, Stalin um, s uh, used uh, signally during the um, the Second World War uh, in the in the in the struggle against uh, Stalin. Uh, sorry, in the struggle against uh, the Nazis. Um, the Bolsheviks um, panicked uh, and. Uh, they overreacted. Um, the the Kronstadters wanted to uh, negotiate uh, with 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 the Bolsheviks. They, they didn't actually at that this point in time want want to overthrow the Bolsheviks. They wanted to put forward their demands. But I mean, this was met with uh, um, a, a really harsh reply. Um, the Bolsheviks were worried um, that um, that. A spring would come because it was March already, and the ice would melt, and that that would throw open the um, the, uh, the 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 channel, the sea channel to uh, to the whites. Um, the revolt was uh, crushed. Um, it was about five hundred, I think, five hundred and twenty-seven actually. Um, uh, Red Army soldiers died, and uh, that, um, about a thousand Kronstadt sailors uh, were killed in the fighting. Um, there were there were mass arrests, and um, about a thousand Kronstadt sailors um, were handed over to the Cheka, which is the uh, uh, Bolshevik secret um, political police. Um, and many of them were executed uh, immediately. Uh, amongst them was uh, per Perkin and uh, Lamanov, you know, who had been editors of the Kronstadt Izvestia. Uh, others were sent to the prison islands, the uh, the concentration camps that had been set up in um, in the Solovetsky Islands in the in the White Sea, so in other words, within the Arctic Circle, uh, where many, many of them perished. Uh, I mean, the, these were prison camps that had been taken over from, from the Whites and immediately converted by the Cheka into um, um, places where, where uh, opponents of the regime were sent uh, with very strict hard labour conditions, in fact, dreadful conditions there. Um, so you, you already got the development of a, uh, 
a gulag system. Um, many escaped over the ice to Finland and, and some actually um, escaped back to their own areas, so it appears. Uh, but um, the Kronstadters were, were hunted down um, for years to come. Um, there's even a case of uh, one uh, Kronstad sailor um, being shot in 1941 in 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 uh, Helsinki uh, when the uh, when the uh, Russians Red Army was retreating. They discovered he was a Kronstadt sailor, and he he was actually shot. A guy called Nikolai Dannenberg. Um, right, could you uh, move it on one, please, Maestro? Uh, so, what's sir? Uh, circumstances led to the revolt uh, so i'm going to tackle these well as, as it already explains it's workers strikes peasants uprising of grain requisition, requisition a mass uprising in siberia a mass uh, uprising in, in the tambov region um and of course the the magnavis movement uh, in uh in the Ukraine, which was led by the uh, anarchist Nesta Makhno, uh, various mutinies with, within the Red Army around um, people like Maslakov, who, who who linked up with with Makhno, uh, uprises in places like Vlog, the Vlogda province. Um, so um, a whole series of peasant uprisings uh, uh, against grain requisitioning in, in Tambov, for example. Uh, the, the 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 revolt started because uh, the old men of the village were beaten by one of the uh, food requis Bolshevik food requisitioning squads uh, for not handing over the the grain surplus. Uh, the other thing uh, that um, caused led up to Kronstadt was the clamp down on left groups. So we had um, the uh, attack on on the anarchists in 1918 that on the Black Guard. In Moscow, um, when all the anarchist centres were attacked by Bolshevik forces and, and crushed, um, we also had the um, as followed of uh, the, the, the suppression of the left socialist revolutionaries um, when some of them rose up uh, because they refused to um, um, go along with the Brest Litovsk Treaty, which they felt. Uh, opened up, up uh, Russia to uh, invasion by the uh, the Allies, and um, which in fact it did because the uh, Austro-German forces marched into the Ukraine. Okay, can you move it on a bit, please? Yeah. And oh no, uh, just go back one more, please. No, just one more, please. Yeah, that's a professionalization. There was another thing. There was a professionalization of the armed forces. Um, the Red Army had uh, originally developed under Bovisk and Krilenko as, as a volunteer army uh, with uh, rank and file soldiers committees that elected their officers. As soon as Trotsky uh, came to um, became um, Commissar of Military Affairs. He, he started changing all that. Within you know, a slew team was brought back. The uh, officers' epaulets were brought back. Return of there was return of corporal punishment, which included flogging, which had you know, happened under under the Tsar. And it, there was shooting for desertion and insubordination and uh, for drunkenness. Uh, and this was all carried out. And uh, at the same time, some of the more the more the the red some of the Red Army commanders who, who were against this, who, who still believed in a in a in a, in a, a revolutionary army, you know, a sort of guerrilla army. Some of them were were shot. People like Shaws, uh, Bog Bogamsky, uh, Lopatkin, and um, uh, Mironov. Um, and uh, Trotsky, you know, this was very unpopular within the fleet because it was imposed in the fleet as well. Um, Trotsky had, uh, uh, became, uh, um, first of all, he was commissar, people's commissar of military affairs. Then he became 
um, people's commissar or maritime matters as well. Um, that, um, and, and, and people were very uh, concerned about the, the return of Zari's officers as, as uh, military specialists. Um, I, I can imagine that there was uh, unrest amongst the in the Bolshevik uh, party itself. The, there was a group called um, the Left Communists who, who wanted to return um, the Red Army to its uh, original um, status of, of all these things like rank and file committees, etc. And, you know, a lot of Bolsheviks thought, hang on. These Tsar's officers are actually able to discipline workers and peasants, you know, because the, the mass of the Red Army was made up of um, workers and peasants. Uh, and uh, they, they felt great uh, disquiet about this, uh, understandably. Um, you've got to remember that, you know, the, the, the Bolshevik party is not a, a monolithic party in some sense. It had all sorts of different tendencies with it. And the Bolsheviks, you know, they'd agitated within the Red Army for exactly these sort of things that, that were now being taken away from them. The, the rank and file committees, um, the end of hierarchy. Um, officers under the control of of the rank and file, so they they they, they were profoundly disturbed. Okay, would you like to uh, move on, please? Uh, yes, we've had all of that, um, and we've had the um, the Petra uh, Pavlos resolution, which was, as I said, to new, immediately hold new elections liberate all political prisoners of socialist parties, uh, secure freedom of assembly for labour unions and peasant organisations. Could you pass it on a bit more to some of the ones? To abolish all p political bureaus because no party should be given special privileges in the propagation of its ideas, etc. And yes, it's all there. I mean, those are just some of the demands of fitting them all together. Oh, yes. The other thing, to equalise the rations of all who work, with the exception of those employed in trades detrimental to health. Now, this is an important thing because um, that was another of the um, of the reasons for the Kronstadt revolt and for the workers' uprisings. The, uh, there was a hierarchy of rations. Uh, of rationing, you know, in in a in a country that was um, faced faced a, a lot of want, lots of uh, different food stock stuffs stuffs lacking, and you know, with um, party officials getting preferential uh, rationing. Um, uh, in fact, one of the uh, one of the factories in Petrograd, the woman worker, got up and says. We're starving while while the, the the party bosses are stuffing their faces, um, and also to abolish the uh, the the Bolshevik fight, fighting detachments in all branches of the army, uh, as uh, and uh, as well as the Bolshevik guards who were kept on duty in mills and factories. You know they were seen as repressive units. Um, and um, to give the peasants full freedom of action in regard to their land and also the right to keep cattle on condition that the peasants manage with their own means, that is, without employing hired labour. Now, uh, the, uh, Lenin had quite a pragmatic approach to the, to, the, to the peasants, whereas Trotsky from the start, was, uh, d despite being um, the son of a, of a kulak, uh, you know, a fairly rich peasant himself, um, had a, a great distrust, distrust for the peasantry, um, and a lot of people were defined as kulaks just because they owned one horse. You know, um, yeah. Anyway, let's carry on. Can you put it on to the next one, please? Um, there was also talk of uh, a third revolution. Um, the third revolution, uh, which was um, would be the completion of the process begun by the February and October revolutions, you know, which was seen as stages, you know, or in a revolution. And these ideas were put forward by anarchists and maximalists, the maximalists have already mentioned. 
Um, so you, 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 it, you've got it put forward by uh, anarchists like Volling and that in the in the pages of the Kronstadters Vestia. Uh, so it, 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 it's manifested there. It talked about the unity of the peasants and the workers and genuine power to the Soviets. It's, now, it's often said that uh, the Kronstadt sailors wanted um, the Soviets without the communists, but they didn't actually say that, although this demand was sometimes raised within the peasant up, up, uh, uprisings, that they're, um, you know, they, some of the peasant uprisings said, we, we want to maintain Soviets, we want to make them all democratic, um, but without the communists. But the Kronstadters didn't actually say that, there's no evidence that they ever said that. Okay, could you um, move on to the next? Well, as I said, um, the Leninist responses to Kronstadt was that it was led by the whites. Uh, it's, it's been argued that, oh, well, in, in, in the present period, that, oh, yeah, the, the Kronstadt's intentions might have been good, but it would lead to counter-revolution. It would open Russia up to invasion by the whites. And also they said they were in favour of free trade in the market. And the other thing was, which I've mentioned already, that the Kronstadt sailors were not the same as the ones involved in 1917. Not the same. Completely different personnel. Um, the original Kronstadt sailors had meant to be... Um, um, falling in combat in it during the civil war and these were a new batch of of um uh, green uh, sailors you know who'd come straight from the countryside who were the uh, pro kulak um okay would you like to move on um as, as regards free trade and the new economic policy i think if you look at what the Kronstadters are saying they were against both war communism World communism of grain requisitioning and, and rationing, and the new uh, what would become the new economic policy, which was actually brought in um, after the Kronstadt revolt to to head off uh, the revolt of both workers and peasants. Uh, like, like, as Ida Met said, who was um, an anarchist. The rebels proclaim that Kronstadt is not asking for freedom of trade, but for genuine power to the Soviets. The Petrograd strikers are also demanding the reopening of the markets and the abolition of the, of, of the roebuck set up by the militia. But they too were stating that freedom of trade by itself would not solve their problems. And um, an oppositional communist called Ante Chiliger, could you move it on, please? Um, uh, Yugoslav and um, oppositional communist who was in Russia at times said the Kronstadt resolution pronounced in favour of the defence of the workers not only against the bureaucratic capitalism of the state but also against the restoration of private capitalism. This resolution and the movement underlying sought for a revolutionary alliance of the proletarian peasant workers with the poorest sections of the country labor, laborers in order that the revolution might develop towards socialism. The new economic policy, on the other hand, was a union of bureaucrats with the upper layers of the village against the proletariat. It was the alliance of state capitalism and private capitalism against socialism. OK, could you advance it, please? Um, the Kronstadt says were not the same as those involved in this myth. Trotsky said the, uh, the Baltic fleet had been inevitably thinned out with respect to personnel. And so a great many of the revolutionary sailors of 1917 had been transferred elsewhere. And they'd been replaced in large measure by accidental elements. And this facilitated the work of the counter-revolutionary organisers who had selected Kronstadt, so it was all white plot. Okay, could you carry on, please? Um, now, this the historian uh, Israel Getzler, who, who wrote an um, in-depth study of Kronstadt, he, he investigated this issue, and he and he he and also another historian called Ewan Maudsley, 
demonstrate that those serving the Baltic fleet on the 1st of January 1921, at least 75.5% were drafted before 1918. And he argued that the veteran politicised red sailors still predominated in Kronstadt at the end of um, 1920. In fact, some of them were on the uh, Provisional Re Revolutionary Committee that had been set up at Kronstadt. Could you uh, go on to the next slide, please? And um, uh, in fact, a leading Czechist called Vasily Survey um, put out a report in uh, March the 7th, 1921, a detailed report is, is who said, and that this is this was um, in the early days of the uh, of the revolt, that a large majority of the sailors of, of the Baltic fleet were and still are professional revolutionaries could well form the basis for a possible third revolution. I mean, Trotsky knew all of this. He, he knew who the sailors were. He, 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 um, he knew that they were more or less the same people who were there in 1917. And, and he, he maintained that position as, as late as 38, 39, when a, a new controversy um, arose around Kronstadt. Uh, which also involved um, people like Victor Serge, who, who questioned Trotsky over this. OK, could you go on to the next um, slide, please? Um, what, what does Kronstadt mean? I think it's the line drawn in the dust. It's whether you support the rebellion or, or are against it. And, and that's what defines your politics, whether you're for a proletarian revolution, a genuine proletarian in revolution or you're against it um one one sailor who who was on, on trial at, at um um after kronstadt he was up before the revolution tribunal he says why did you oppose yourself to soviet power to which he replied for us ignorant people power whatever it whatever it's called is all the same OK. Last slide, please. Um, so a little quote. I'm not going to read it out. You can read it for yourself. Um, from the Kronstadt's Vestia um, towards the end of um, the revolt. All right, I will read it out. You fell as sacrifices to the great struggle. Your unforgettable name shall not die in the noble memory of the labouring people for whose fortune you laid down your wild heads. In the battle's roar, you did not think of yourselves. Warriors for an idea, you did not tremble. Of the revolution of labour gave an example of steadfast firmness in battle for your rights. You went forward under the slogan, victory or death, you died. We who are alive shall carry the battle to its end. We vow on your fresh graves to be victorious or to lie next to you. Already the light of the great liberation of labourers has begun to shine. OK, thank you. Um, OK, over to you, Bonnie. Thank you. I'm not going to speak long. I know many of you will want to talk about There's some background noise. Somewhere. Oh. Um, yeah. So I'm not going to talk long, but the, the thing is, is there's, there might be a tendency to think that, oh, this happened in the Russian Revolution. This happened that Kronstadt was an exception. And really, Bolshevism doesn't have to be like this. And I'd just like to say a few things about Bolshevism today. And this is based on some personal experience, both having been a member of the SWP and also um, involved in quite a number of struggles where I come across uh, Bolshevists in action. And there's a number of things that make it clear that Kronstadt was not an exception, that a lot of these things that happened then are still happening now, obviously not to the same tragic consequences, but still I think the consequences are very dire. Um, one of them is the, the insistence on a centralized structure. And uh, they call it democratic centralism. 
and there's very excuses made for it, but basically it is about a central committee controlling pretty much everything that happens. And I did experience this mainly because if you're an ordinary member in a group of branches, they called it, the amount of different changes that used to come down from the center where you know, the group would, would, would split, would change direction quite frequently. I was actually a member when it was still international socialism. And I remember the change from International Socialism to Socialist Workers' Party, and uh, nothing was explained. All of a sudden, we were going to be the Socialist Workers' Party, and uh, you either were for it or you were ridiculed for being against it, and that decision came down from the center. Other examples, there's been group after group who have been thrown out of, of the SWP for various sins of having independent politics or questioning the leadership. And this has happened throughout its history. The other thing that has uh, is part of the Bolshevik tendency is this idea of the line, that there is some kind of the center decides on what the priorities are going to be. And, uh, and again, as I said before, people are ended up changing from one campaign to another, depending on what the center decides is the priority. And uh, so let's say that you were involved in a campaign and all of a sudden it wasn't a priority anymore, you would be left high and dry. Um, and for example, I remember, you know, there's been several different things that have happened. Um, Grenfell was one of them, climate change, now it's Black Lives Matter. So these, the Bolshevik groups, they go from one thing to another, wherever they think will suit their own interests. And I think that is the key point. It's not, I'm sure there are individuals who are, are sincere and interested in the struggle, but for the leadership, for the central committee, it's all about manipulating and how they can get as much influence, how they can recruit as much. And, uh, and that's the principle, the, the, the interests of the party come before the actual struggles. And I had been involved in supporting a, a Garner Steakhouse strike for probably about a year. And at one point, this is when I was in the SWP and it had been, you know, flavor of the month for a while. But then because we weren't recruiting, um, it, all of a sudden they weren't interested anymore and any resources we might have had got pulled from us. And we were just left and marginalized because that was no longer a political priority because we hadn't done what we were meant to do, which was recruit new members. Um, so it is a calculated, uh, manipulation with the aim to recruit. So they also use things like front. So two things they often do that you'll have noticed is when they call, what call they call for demos as one of their main activities. And you wonder why. Every, I've been involved in so many different things and anyone from one of the Bolshevik organizations seems obsessed by, let's call the demonstration. And you're wondering why. And of course, a demonstration is something where they can have their placards, they can have their stalls, they can do all these things in order to, to attract people. And they're busy, you know, you've seen them, they're busy there with their petitions, getting people to sign up for this, that and the other, the schools, the school strikes at the Gren Grenfell and all the different campaigns that have been going on. The other thing they do is they actually use things like front organizations and uh, stand up to racism, for example, is one of them, or they might also use the trade unions as something as a way to sort of get their politics through. And I have a couple of examples from case studies, having been quite involved in the housing campaigns. Obviously, there's a lot of people doing some apparently good work. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Revolutionary Communist Group. And they, some of their members are involved in the group Focus E15. And there's no doubt that Focus E15 was a brilliant group and did loads of good stuff. And the RCG members that were there on the ground were very sincere and very good and very dedicated to that struggle. The problem is, though, is that often the people from their center would come around to just to make sure they were pushing the RCG line. So things would happen, you'd have a stall that was meant to be a stall for ordinary people, you know, out on the street of Stratford, and you would make sure that they had their fight racism, fight imperialism paper in prime locations. There'd be a protest through, uh, through Newham, and you'd have the Focus E15 people at the front, but right behind them was a huge banner from, for the, uh, the RCG, almost dominating over the, the Focus E15 people. 
So again, it's yes, they were sincere, many of them, but also how they were trying to use a lot of this to see how they how they could get ahead for their own organization. Um, other examples would be, of course, like Grenfell, where the Bolsheviks, they, was, they were all over it like flies. And yes, people were concerned, but they had their stalls every day. They got they set up various organizations and they did actually have quite a number of success in recruiting people from the Grenfell. But then once Grenfell becomes not so to the forefront of struggles anymore, then, of course, they'll move on to something else. Um, other things, for example, that they might do is if they're involved in a network or a more general campaign is they will only attend or get involved if there's something in it for them. So I've been involved in the Radical Housing Network and I found that I felt that some of the groups would come along like Defend Council Housing, which SWP or the Focus E15, not always them so much, but later when some of the more organizational members started coming along. It was all about getting support for when the, the campaign seemed to attract all sorts of people, including people from the uh, Socialist Party. And uh, they were very keen. We also had quite a number of people from the Green Party. It happened to be just before the election and both the Socialist Party and the Green Party were standing for election. And they came to the campaign and they were full of ideas. Oh, we must do this. We must do that. Of course, uh, calling a demonstration was one of the main ones. But as soon as the election was over, as soon as they realized that, oh, we're not going to get that much out of it, they, they dropped it. And I'm sure many of you will have similar experiences. So the conclusion is that really the centralist structure of the Bolshevik organizations does make it easier for them to mobilize members. Like in the Soviet Union, they were able to be as successful as they did because they had the centralized structure. But at what price? Yes, they can afford to be fund their activities, they can have all their placards, they can have their good websites, et cetera, et cetera, but at what cost? Um, they, they're cleverly using now some of our own language. They managed to get a Grenfell survivor to speak at one of their Marxist, Marxism rallies and, they, and, and saying, oh, we have to do things for ourselves, you know, coming up with a sort of self-organizing language. They talk now about black people self-organizing, and they also invited things like the LSE cleaners. So they're trying to tap in to sort of some sort of anarchist principles about organizing. So, but if you look at the websites and everything, you still see that they're defending democratic centralism and they do make it sound like it's not a problem, but in fact, it is. So really, we may not be exactly in the dire situation of the Russian revolution, but the thing is, where the, big, the bigger and better finance Bolshevik parties are in a better position as well as more willing to push their way into struggles and take up positions and to dominate. And if things don't go their way, if they can't get anything out of it, they will quickly turn. And those who they were supporting one day will be on the scrap heap the next. And we know that meant what that meant for the Kronstadt sailors. So that's just some thoughts on my experience of organizing with Bolsheviks today and the legacy of Kronstadt.